You see, when, as a Christian, you've been baptized, you gave your life to the Lord, you turned your life around, you've made significant changes in your life. But that's only the beginning, not the end. The devil isn't going to let you go just like that. No, he's going to fight to bring you back. In this mode of spiritual attack, you'll notice things like friends from the past come back into your life, trying to draw you backward. Certain people around you will begin to entice you to fall back into old sinful habits. This is the devil testing you and tempting you so that you would leave everything godly for the pleasures of the world. It's like the parable Jesus tells about the farmer planting seeds in Matthew 13. Some seeds fall on thorny ground, and as the plant grows, the thorns choke the plants, and they don't produce fruit. Jesus tells us this represents those who hear the word, receive the word, but cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. We must guard against this attack by being vigilant about our company and staying plugged into a Bible-led, godly community. So here's the thing. Beware who's in your inner circle. Beware of the company you keep. Some people will push you forward, indeed, but some people come only to pull you backwards, and we need to be wise when it comes to those around us. The devil is committed to preventing people from knowing God and trusting Him with their lives. The enemy's tactics do differ depending on whether someone is already a Christian or not, but his ultimate purpose is always to keep people from experiencing the love of God. Now, let me clarify this for everyone listening. Spiritual warfare is not something to be feared because the battle belongs to the Lord. This war is not one that we fight on our own, but we allow God to fight for us because it's only when we do this that we will be able to wage victorious spiritual warfare. This war affects every area of your life. There is no way you can avoid the conflict. A lot of Christians don't even know they're at war, but others can see the results of the battle in their lives because they have become casualties of spiritual warfare. They're discouraged, depressed, downtrodden, and defeated. Others are marital and family casualties. Divorce, conflict, and abuse are some of the battle scars these believers bear. Let me give you some insight on the enemy's strategy when it comes to spiritual warfare. There are four things the enemy sets out to achieve when he attacks believers. These four things are to discourage, to distract, to stir discontent, and to bring discord. Allow me to elaborate. The enemy seeks to discourage you from your faith. The enemy seeks to distract you from your calling with worldly pleasure and all manner of temptation. The enemy seeks to stir discontent in your physical life. And finally, the enemy seeks to bring discord between you and other believers to stop the unity of the gospel. So here's how you gain victory. The Bible tells us that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. It's important to take regular time alone with God, preferably as free from distractions as possible. Jesus wanted to give God his full attention and spend time with his heavenly Father. If even Jesus needed to withdraw from crowds and his friends to be alone with God, and Jesus is God, how much more do his followers need to do the same? Prayer is a powerful weapon for spiritual warfare. Prayer is you giving your battles to God. You're calling on Him to engage in the battle for you. There's no doubt that we live in a time in which it's very difficult to know whether what we face in day-to-day -day circumstances is just life happening, or if it's something beyond this world that we need to address as spiritual warfare. Without the discernment of God working in our lives, we have absolutely no hope of recognizing the difference between just life and the spiritual attack of the enemy of our soul. The Bible teaches us that the devil comes to steal, to kill, to destroy, but Jesus came to give us an abundant life. The Word also tells us to be sober-minded, be watchful, 
Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But James 4, 7 said, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In every area of our lives that the enemy may try and attack us spiritually, God has made a way of escape. But it does take discernment to know the difference between just life and spiritual battles. The carnal man has no hope of knowing the difference. But the person who walks with God will be given what he needs to both see the battle and win the battle because he is victorious in Jesus Christ. We cannot receive the things of God without spiritual discernment, and we cannot have spiritual discernment if we are living as a natural man giving into the desires of our carnal flesh. The writers of Hebrews in chapter 5 verse 14 eloquently stated, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In other words, it takes a lot of practice to become mature, but it takes maturity to be able to discern good from evil. There are many other questions that can be addressed to help us understand whether we are living in a carnal state or a spiritual one. Do we love God and people more than we love ourselves? Do we seek pleasure more than we seek God? Are we content with where we are and with what we have, or do we always want more? Are we always willing to forgive other people when they do things that hurt us? Do we spend time with God in prayer for others, even those we believe to be our enemies? The truth is that we must first make sure we are living a life of spiritual maturity, denying our carnal nature. In his letter to the Philippians, the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 to 4, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Carnally-minded people seem to always be more troubled about the issues they have rather than the problems or circumstances of other people. Spiritually-minded people understand that when they help the people around them through their difficulties, God will always make a way to get through the complications that arise in their own personal lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 5 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of of Christ. This is one of those passages of Scripture that really puts things into perspective. The Bible is telling us here that although we live in this world, we do not and we should not fight our battles like the world. In fact, the weapons that we have available to us aren't physical weapons. But note how the Bible says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. The weapons we can access as children of God have divine power. They are weapons unlike anything in this world because they are heavenly weapons. And at the mention of the word weapons, people usually think of the physical weapons in this world like a bat or a gun. However, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints 
and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God is one of the weapons that we have as children of God. It's a weapon that is powerful. The conflicts you face, the battles you face, the Lord has the final say over all of that. So I encourage you people of God to trust God, trust in the word of the Lord, trust in his promises, and you will have the victory. One of the greatest biblical truths to be revealed is that in addition to the physical realm that we see, in addition to what the naked eye can see and what our hands can touch, there also exists an unseen world, an invisible world, an invisible spirit realm, a world that can't be seen by the naked eye, but it's inhabited by good and evil spirit beings. And both these set of beings affect our world every single day. We interact with them more than we think. There's a reason the Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Scripture is not there to entertain us and keep us occupied. It's there to teach us, to edify us, instruct, encourage, and yes, even warn us. Now, the devil is cunning. And he wants you to either believe that he doesn't exist or to be afraid of him. And if he cannot do either of those, then he wants you to have a lack of knowledge regarding the authority that you've been given by Jesus Christ. Luke 10 verse 19 says, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Satan doesn't want you to know that. And he also does not want you to know what Matthew 18 verse 18 says. It's another example of the kind of authority the devil doesn't want us to know. It says, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, there is no way the devil would even think about coming up against a Christian who knows the authority they have in Jesus Christ. There is no way that Satan and his demons would want to come up against a man or woman clothed in the full armor of God. Not one who has the knowledge that the resurrection power of Jesus Christ is also in them and available to them. We need knowledge. We need knowledge concerning the authority we have in Jesus because when you lack this knowledge, there is no way that you can walk in dominion. Nothing is hidden in the spirit realm, not even your lack of knowledge. And in order to gain knowledge, you have to invest time and you have to put in the effort to seek the Lord. Because when you want to get something that is deep, you have to dig deep to find it. There are some deep revelations that only God can reveal to you if you chase him with an intensity. Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know, according to Jeremiah 33, verse 3. So I encourage you to equip yourself, to equip yourself with the knowledge of who you are in Christ. So when the devil looks at you, let him see the light of the Lord in your life. Let him see a believer who is suited and booted with their God-given authority. Let him see the anointing that is over your life. I want you to understand that as children of God, we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. 
For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18.